you've transcended a liminal threshold into history fuzz, a realm of contemplative inquiry in which leading researchers discuss the motivations, tools and skills of the sky watchers, surveyors, architects and builders who delineated monumental landscapes with awe-inspiring structures enshrining their diverse cosmic chronicles in stone. I'm your host, Ashley Cowie. You can unlock videos, maps, articles and enjoy early ad-free new episodes by becoming a member on HistoryFuzz.com where you can also apply to join our team exploring and filming archaeology documentaries in the Andean Highlands of Colombia. Dr. Gail Higginbottom is a landscape archaeologist, cultural heritage manager and theorist specialising in Europe's ancient and prehistoric cultures. Utilising digital archaeology including drones, photogrammetry, geographical information systems and 3D software, Gail recreates night skies and interprets them against past landscapes. In this episode, we discuss archaeoastronomy and cultural astronomy in Neolithic and Bronze Age Scotland. Gail describes the unified roles of community sky watchers and emerging priestly classes, explaining how cosmic order folded into oneness, contrasting with the modern tendency for creating dualities. Let me show you this, Gil. Do you know what that is? I think I'm going to make it bigger. <laughs> it's called a Muzi Cozy. Oh, okay, Muzi Cozy. No, I don't know that. Tell me. It's a headband and it has two speakers just above your ears and it links ah. with your phone. What it means is new fathers like me can now build bizarre multicolored towers with perhaps a giraffe in the middle and <laughs> listen to an astronomy podcast at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Oh my goodness. Also, oh, how old's your little one? 14 months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A wee boy and I'm loving uh -huh. it. Oh, uh, that's super. Do you have children, Gail? No, but I do know plenty of I was going to say guys in particular would say, no, 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 no. And then it happens, they go, oh, my God, it was amazing. Uh -huh. I didn't plan, but oh, my God. <laughs> Mama, yeah, I know. Do you have enough energy still? you have enough energy still? Because you're probably energetic anyway. But I worry about that. Like, I'm fine now, but what am I going to be like in 12 years when he's needing someone to stick up for him and stuff? And I worry about these things, but mm. you can control what you can control. And if I think in any any way I'm going to control time, then I'd need to have a good, thorough look at myself, Gail, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you, Gail, what your interests are in physics. Are you into classical mechanics or into cosmology and Ah, ah, with physics, mostly my association is with astrophysics and I am not formally trained in astrophysics. I did my PhD uh, in arts and science and I did the history of, partially the history of science from ancient Greek times in the past, that is. And so my supervisor for my, one of my supervisors for my thesis was in astrophysics. So I got to learn quite a bit of uh, astrophysics superficially. I couldn't do any analysis or run any uh, Monte-Carlo simulations of uh, astrophysical data, uh, but I certainly learned quite a bit at that time. Since then, I haven't. I've had an association with such departments, but I don't follow uh, what's being discovered or the techniques these days or anything like that. So, but it's it's just fascinating knowing the the history uh, of universe and where different things come from and dark matter and all of that to the universe is a fascinating place. I would imagine or assume, dare I say, that having a background in physics, which is essentially measuring, it gives you a really good 
fundamental background for archaeoastronomy? Um, yes, definitely. But also what helped me is um, I learned statistics actually through psychology. I used to be a social science researcher and I did several topics at university and I did three majors and one of them was in psychology. And so I learned how to apply uh, statistics and which statistics to use and so on. So stepping into the Department of Physics, I, at least I had a background to understand what I was supposed to be doing <laughs> when I did archaeoastronomy, which was, of course, I like to follow the statistical approach as a first step to know what you really have there and are you imagining what you're seeing? Are there really Mm. patterns or is it just something that humans like to find, which are patterns, (laughs) by staring at pictures and things like that? We're going to dive into intentionality as a topic matter later on, but what you're doing is quite unique because you're addressing archaeological subjects with left brain and right brain, whereby you know the maths and the statistics, but you know the way people think and how they may have worked within the actual landscapes. Is that right? That's a nice way to describe it, I think. Uh, However, to try and understand how people thought in the past is is really tricky. I mean, even now we find it difficult to understand how people think. But so we just use our best knowledge to hand. Uh, For example, you might know as... uh, might be researching social psychology and the dynamics of groups. And that may help you to really understand why people behave in certain ways at certain times when you already know the variables of the groups um, and how they're operating, for instance. So you understand why they're doing what they did, for, just as a for instance. When did you first arrive and begin studying the landscapes of Scotland where I was brought up? You know, I spent 25 years trying to get out. You obviously spent quite a long time trying to get in. I was doing my master's at the time at the University of Adelaide and I took three months off to go into Europe uh, to do two things. One was to look at things that I'd already studied, which was eight years of ancient Greek culture and the Mediterranean, but primarily Greece. And secondly, uh, I wanted to travel around parts of Scotland to see the standing stones that I was beginning to study. And I had an amazing time out there. I was going through Argyle, Kilmartin Valley, a sky. I went out to Lewis and saw Callanish and other stone monuments around there. And a lady whose name was at that time Margaret Ponty, she was an eclectic um amateur archaeologist who dedicated her life to the Standing Stones on Lewis and she very kindly took me around when I was a student to freeze to death (laughs) with horizontal hair in the wind, walking around Callanish and so on. It was amazing. And then I went up to Orkney and I met Colin Richards up there when they were excavating Crossy Crown, I think, and other settlement sites on Orkney. And he took me around uh, those sites and then I went to see Brompton. Were you visiting these sites as a tourist or as an archaeologist? I was an archaeologist in training at that time, really, and I was starting out as a landscape archaeologist because my undergraduate degree is classical studies, psychology and ancient philosophy and history. And so um, I literally started in archaeology as a postgraduate. Mm-hmm. So I was literally teaching myself there, but going around and meeting the experts. I then travelled around Britain and uh, met all these people I'd set up meetings with because I was quite bold at the time. I used to just ring up people, hello, (laughs) my name's Gail, I'm from Australia, can I meet you? And uh, I was very lucky that all these people very kindly uh, said, yeah, sure, uh, come and find out. So, And also rang the, without knowing, the head of the Ordnance Survey group after a Royal Commission gave me a number, said, if you need this data, you can bring these people. I said, oh, sure. (laughs) Did you visit any sites in Caithness? Not at that time. I visited Caithness later Uh, mm, and uh, got to crawl around inside and outside of tombs and so forth. That was at a later date Mm -hmm. when I finished my PhD. I'm from Caithness and we say that... I was wondering... Orkney wears her archaeological jewels around her neck, while Kate Ness keeps hers in her pocket. Oh, what a beautiful saying. 
those tombs there are incredible in Caithness. I think they're exceedingly striking. And old. Yes. You know, predating the monumental circles of Orkney. Of course, most of the larger tombs most certainly do uh, predate stone circles. Um, the largest stone circles are probably don't predate approximately 3000 BC. Mm -hmm. We always thought it was a thing of beauty that while hundreds of tourists now, not thousands, visit the Campster Cairns, which is the icon for Caithness archaeology, we fished. We fly fished, Gail, and why we fly fished there was because the stream about 400 metres from Campster Cairns is the the origin, the source of the Wick River. Ah. Now that must be cosmologically significant because not only does it represent the beginning and the end of the main source of fishing and survival, but it's um, the, all of the salmon that were spawned there every seven years return so you could virtually hook fully grown fish out of that feeder barn. That's very interesting. Um... Hmm. Uh, the thing about landscapes is that I think they're cosmological in their entirety. Mm. And anything that occurs is seen to be part of the cosmological order. And people taught themselves that cosmological order, which is both uh, seen uh, on the, in the landscape with the way the animals behave, the way the planets and the stars behave and everything that exists around them. You know, you have to make a story which explains both the beauty and the drama of these things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of connections you're talking about would be obvious to the people who were living there in that landscape at that time. Yeah, and there's been studies done on the Caithness Cairns to show that a large percentage, I don't recall what it is, but it's somewhere between 40 and 60% aligned to the southeast so loosely with the solstice, but I think a greater percentage align with local water sources, mm. which would suggest that maybe always associating a burial cairn alignment with archaeoastronomy is possibly a leap too far. And what if it was aligned to where a ruler died or was born mm. somewhere around the winter. Would you agree that there's maybe too much effort put in establishing accuracy with modern standards now, like archaeoastronomers proving a site is definite to within half an arc second of accuracy? I don't think our predecessors worked on that level of accuracy, Gail, did they? <laughs> I think most archaeoastronomers would agree with you on that, but it's not necessarily to that degree of accuracy. Uh, at least now we're talking about the cultures within the British Isles and probably Western Europe, I'm not discussing things that happen thousands of years later, say somewhere like South America, which is like another story altogether. Accuracy or Asia, that was very important to them. But certainly in the British Isles around in the prehistorical times, Neolithic and Bronze Age that you're talking about, definitely it's, I think it's about the show and what you see and trying to connect the monuments themselves whether that happens to be an um, astronomical thing or whether that happens to be a historic thing. I'm sure people thought everything folded in together. And in a sense, I was going to try and pull apart what you were saying because there's slightly two different questions. You know, how do you separate one level of cosmic order from the other and why it never has to be just one thing? It doesn't have to be one thing. And when people themselves see those connections, they must bring them together somehow, I think. Gail, can you see? I'm straining, I'm biting my tongue and genuinely pulling back what I have to say because two weeks ago I interviewed a Dr. Robert Weiner who is a researcher of the Chacoan Canyon or the Chaco Canyon. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. He is a specialist on the, the causeways, the sacred ceremonial roads, mm. and the construction of the kivas, the sacred circular roundhouses. Oh, yes, the kivas. Wonderful. He was describing functionality of some of the roads to me. And I asked him this, how much does your inclination towards creating dualities and categories get in the way of your research? And apparently with you, it doesn't. 
Mm. You're not inclined to create dualities. You've just suggested that it's all one. Mm. I think that's really quite a revolutionary way to look at it as an archaeologist. Most are inclined to categorise and get it onto a spreadsheet. <laughs> that's a very interesting take. I uh, don't need to <laughs> comment on other people's uh, work or approaches because often as well. I say it in the most positive way, Gail. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We engaged great over that, so carry on, please. Oh, absolutely. No, no, no. I was just going to say that it's also important often to have specialists too because then they know how to answer those very particular questions. Absolutely. You know, whether, say, you've got a geneticist and you go, okay. So they are drilling down into that and then I might drill down into something else and then we come together and we try, how do we massage this together let me massage the results to get what you want <laughs> i meant that thing of what are the connections here how do things connect and the thing that you learn certainly as a psychologist or a historian as well because i've also trained as a historian uh, the multi-level of humanity and life itself is has just enormous and everything's so expansive and we keep trying to pull it in so that we can understand it. To illustrate what you've just said, my first episode, my first recording was with a physicist, Dr. Giulio Magli from the Milan Polytechnic. Mm. He's done published lots of papers on Roman archaeoastronomy, but recently branching into camera landscapes of Cambodia and Inca Peru. Wow. I brought him in because you've when you're describing different levels of perceiving these landscapes, no matter where they are, there's an inclination to try and determine astronomical significance. But what Giulio Magli pointed out was that many of the alignments of the ancient world had purely mythological and cosmological significance. Oh, yes. Yeah. And what he showed as an example, which he could maybe talk around in Scottish context, is mm. he showed that the world believes the pyramids of Egypt are aligned to Orion's belt because a series of pop cultural books in the 60s. Mm -hmm. What he shows is it doesn't have anything to do with Orion's belt, but the three corners align with the temple of Heliopolis, which has mm -hmm. huge religious associations with Ra. It's a cosmological line. It, and it, what it does is it cracks a pop cultural icon of Egypt. Yes. Yes, yes. In the Scottish context, have you found any similar such alignments or orientations? That's the question. Ah, uh, well... From a lake to a mountain with a temple in between. This is a very interesting question. Um, the problem is that what is astrology? Mm -hmm. And what is the history of archaeoastronomy? And what is archaeoastronomy? So... The, the point is that if you think of like the really early definition, astrology, not modern astrology, let's just forget that, but if you think of ancient astrology, and that is the idea that you think that planetary objects have an, either have a direct influence on you or they reflect a reality that could happen because when these things occur, it happens at the same time as this other thing. There may be a cause and effect, but regardless, we are part of the cosmos and our lives are affected by that cosmos. I'm trying to think in more in ancient terms yeah, yeah. right now, not, not modern terms. Mm -hmm. So archaeoastronomy, which links to belief systems of the sacredness of things, you can't separate the concept of the sacredness of something and whether you're part of this greater cosmological order. Uh, they're one and the same. So there's, uh, yes, so I, I tend to steer away from, um, the Western concepts of astrology at this point. Mm. And so I can't, in ancient times or prehistoric times, though, people may well have had a belief system that said mm -hmm. that whatever is occurring uh, both on the sky or within the earth will affect our lives or will affect someone else's life. Cause you see things like when stars appear, 
when this weather occurs, the fish are happening. And that's reflected by a constellation that appears only at certain times of the year. Is that astrology? Mm. <laughs> Can you see what I'm saying there? Yeah, I, I do. So let's put ourselves back in Neolithic Caithness rather than Orkney. Orkney gets all the attention. If it's 3000 BC and we're standing on a Caithness coastline, we've cleared our field of rocks, we've leveled a platform, mm -hmm. and there's going to be somebody who's concerned with making sure the local landscape environment suits hierophanies like the moon rising behind that notch on its maximum. Mm -hmm. so that person might be concerned with making sure that there's some kind of water source on the winter solstice to sunset. But there's another level. So let's just say that that's the astronomical aspect of what we're talking yes, about. Yes, absolutely. There's also a consideration by somebody there going, hang on a minute, I'm trying to make a calendar with this. I need true astronomy. I need a meridian to the north, celestial pole, mm. because an astronomer isn't monitoring what's coming up in the, the horizons because of the variables. He's watching the moon going over the, a meridian, a fixed established meridian. So my question to you is, have you identified any north to south meridians that were perhaps used by astronomers making calendars rather than cosmological concerned people? I don't think you can separate those two points at all. Absolutely not. The point is that you need someone who's either who's skilled and gifted, like combinations, I'll see them both as skilled and gifted people, um, who uh, connect your landscape and your astronomy and everything goes together. That's, that is cosmological and that is sacred. It, it, you can't separate that at all. I don't think there were people who just were fixated on just the calendar and the astronomy. Uh -huh. The reason that it was important is because of their belief system about it, as I, as I conceive it, obviously, as I conceive it. Um, that was the first point I wanted to make. But uh -huh. Yes, absolutely. Both Kalanish and Stennis, Stennis have north-south lines. Uh, Stennis is a little bit like maybe just a couple of degrees out, but it's basically north-south. Okay, that, and we're talking then about the axis of the shape of the excavated circle of Seness, and it has a lovely half in the centre. And if you do the central point of the half, that's running through the axis of that circle. And then Kalanish, the north south is, uh, the exact north south, I would say, is um, represented by a central stone, which does actually run north south. And its line, the axis of that stone, is, is not so. Okay. And there are even some uh, standing stone alignment, which escaped me their names now. Um, there might be one on Colin Tyree, actually. <clears throat> and they run north-south. And, of course, once you have your north-south, you can, uh, it helps you plot out other things. There's something else important about the north-south, sorry. Mm, take your time. Uh, yes, of course. Um, the north the north and south points are also easier to establish than you might think. So one way is, of course, is that, well, hopefully I don't get this back to front, but I think at the winter solstice at midday, when the sun is at its uh, peak uh, in the sky, its position in the sky, that's midday and that's south. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the opposite is north of that. But you can have certain polar bodies. There was no north... Uh, there was no um, North Star, so to speak, uh, when these st standing stones were built, uh, the circles. Uh, but, of course, you have uh, things going around in a circle uh, around the north, so you can get an approximate north as well that way. Interesting. So you have found evidence of meridians, and I believe about 3000 BC, Thuban, the tale of Draco, the constellation, Draco was close to but as you say not in the celestial pole so what i've got for you now gail is now that we've lodged into how you think i would like to ask you a question perhaps about a colleague you might not know him but maybe you do do you know kenneth brophy oh yes he's amazing yes he is and he gives the best talks ever 
I love going to his lectures. He's so clever, clever guy. Right. I agree in its fullest. So to let you know, my fourth recording for this podcast was with Kenny Brothy because I met him 25 years ago in Caithness when he was still a student. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. So Kenny and I were an hour into the podcast and I told him something that I had researched 20 years ago and had just not done much with. So mm -hmm. I'd like to share it with you and get your opinion on it. A, its significance, and B, if you think it's intentional Ooh. or not. <laughs> so Kenny and I discussed this. Yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it in a nutshell for you, and then I'm gonna stop. In Caithness, there is a band of standing stone fans. Are you aware of the fan structures? Oh yes, I know them. Yeah, absolutely. They excavated one. Mm. Great. So they exist from Dunry in the north to Learable Hill in the south. Yeah. There's four stone rows, four quadruples, three triplets, and at least four mounds surrounding the stones. Um, every 18.6 years on the lunar minimum, the moon skirts along the southern horizon of Caithness behind Morvan Scarabin mountain range, creating a lunar Herophony. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing, Gil. This is what I told Kenny. <laughs> Learble Hill to 15.4 metres accuracy is exactly on the same latitude as the centre stone of the Kalanish Circle. Mm -hmm. The band of latitude in which the fans which Tom suggested had lunar associations is in the same band as Kalanish in the West. Now, I'm not saying that the Neolithic engineers that they were in contact with. Do you th think monuments could have been located to make use of this lunar phenomenon? Because if you move 40 miles to the north out of with this latitude band of fans, it's below the horizon, doesn't work. If you move south 40, 60 miles, it's, it's a degree in the air and it doesn't work. Do you think the builders could have perhaps been aware at Kalanish and in Caithness that this is a very special latitude? Nothing to do with the local topography, but do you think they would have been aware that, that this occurs only on this latitude, perhaps suggesting the building of Kalanish as a lunar observatory and the building of the fans correctly, as Tom said, associated with lunar astronomy. What, what's your thoughts on that? Coincidence? Basically, uh, look, Kalanish, I believe, does have a lunar association. I already think that, but, I, but so do many other sites in Scotland. Uh -huh. uh, whether people knew there was a particular latitude where you could see things or not, because at Kalanish there's a maximum. Oh, is there? Within the structure? Oh, no. <laughs> There's an outlier mound? Yeah, we'll, we'll discuss it later. So uh, whether people knew whether it was linked to a latitude, a very particular latitude, I couldn't say, but I could say, I, can, I feel that I can say that it's very clear to people that there were certain visions that you could, that you could see and most certainly there are places where these phenomena occur and they're really striking. And so, for example, from uh, as you were flagging that when you're um, in the circle of Kalanish, um, you can there's a very small uh, rocky outcrop next to Kalanish, and you can see the minor standstill moon. Let's say it's full because that's the most striking event that you can observe visually. It literally rolls across an arc across this rocky outcrop, and it's very, very, very striking. And this rocky outcrop is very close to Kalanish Circle itself. So it's even going to be more striking and very likely that light as well will be falling on you and the circle and create amazing shadow patterns with the stone. Yeah. Your title needs change from archaeoastronomer to cultural astronomer. Do you get yes. that? Yes, I do. And I usually call myself a cultural astronomer these days. Archaeoastronomy is the study of astronomy and architectural archaeology, and cultural astronomy is really the study of astronomy and ethnography. Well, it can be. It can be, yes, what you're saying. Okay. But I call myself a cultural astronomer because I'm looking at how astronomy and the sky and the bodies within the sky 
connect to people's belief systems and understanding about their world regardless of when they existed. Yeah. And whether or not there's any ethnographic information about that group. And because I usually, of course, work with pre prehistory, mm -hmm. there's no direct ethnographic information with my groups uh, because there's no writing. Other people may work with uh, prehistoric cultures, I use that broadly, whatever that might mean, uh, or pre-compact cultures who do have writing Gail, you said to me a minute ago you didn't feel quite comfortable talking about someone else's work, but I'm going to put you in the spot because Kenny said to me after I, I threw that one at me, he says, right, Ash, here's one for you. I haven't published it yet. I will be this year, but he goes, I'll put it out in your podcast so people can tell me what they think. So let me put it to you. Kenny, Ke regarding these Standing Stone fans, Kenny said, mm -hmm. what if Tom is wrong? And they don't weren't used as lunar chronometers. What if each of the stones represents somebody in a lineage? Yeah. And that the the rows represent a lineage within an area perhaps coming together and it was a ceremonial site. What do you think about the rows not being archaeoastronomical but being not gravestones either, but memorial symbolic stones of some kind? Yeah. Oh, look, I actually love that idea. And the mm -hmm. thing, again, is that I never think you can separate stuff. It's never on its own. Yeah. Um, and I know that he, oh, gosh, when, when they were, Lyra Hill, when they were actually excavating that, when they had a report on that, they were saying they thought they were associated with the cans and going toward, like, representing, um, fanning towards this uh, person or personages in in the can and it was connected to them. But I've also heard a similar story to the massive standing stones that they have in Brittany, those rows upon rows of massive, massive standing stones where they've actually talked about, I read a paper on that where they're talking about the lineage of the people that came to the place, mm -hmm. basically, and that that's what those stones represent. And I think it's wonderful. And I, the, the point is that you can't separate your own life and your own lineage from that of the greater world around you. And what I well, I guess what I mean by that, and perhaps inspired by in some ways by, you know, the ancient Greek mythologies where people uh connect themselves to the creators and the gods and all of that. The lineage goes right back to the beginning of creation in a sense. Mm -hmm. We are associated with these first places or first gods. Our people are and I think it's very, you know, we are together with these things. Oh, I really like that idea that of Kenny's of those. And um, why wouldn't you have a sacred place to place your lineage? I said to Kenny that I would ask for opinions. But, and so you agree that it's a lovely, I, I, the word I used was I said, Kenny, that's a beautiful idea. Yes, absolutely. It is. And I do think that standing stones, well, would I have in the past, since probably my thesis, which is a long time ago now, said that standing stones are part of society. They're part of people's society. I remember at the uh, 2005 or six at Cork saying these, these standing stones are members of people's societies. They are doing something for the society and they're engaging in an activity that it is the belief system. We are all part of that belief system. Yeah. And we have a place in that system. And a lineage has a place in that and standing stones do. And the thing is that whatever a standing stone is, it's not necessarily exactly the same thing through time. As Kenny has often said to me, hey, just you know, nearly think it might have been that. Does it mean it was that in a bronze age? And I go, sure. But still, it's still attached somehow to the greater cosmology of the astronomy the majority, I'm not saying every single one, but that doesn't mean it doesn't, it's not part of a slightly different belief system now or that it represents something else as well or is something else as well, sorry, is something else as well. Standing Stone Lud in the Bower Madden district is the largest men here, single standing stone in the county. It's a banana shaped stone. 20 metres to the northeast is a recumbent stone. And Tom measured this with Les Myatt and Kate Ness and showed that it had a winter solstice alignment. Mm -hmm. It did. But you know what, Gail, when you go there 
and you look to the north, it's positioned in such a way that only from that hilltop can you see Orkney, the island, 20 miles to the north. And I think, mm. I think yes, it perhaps was significant to the winter solstice to ceremonialise that alignment, but I think having Orkney within 10 degrees of the northern aspect was perhaps equally as important. But my point there is, Gail, is that stone started out with those dynamics. But in the Bronze Age, you can see that there were mounds built around it. It became the centre of a burial site. And then by the 14th century, it was being associated with witchcraft and it was being worshipped as Lud. Mm. Um, late Bronze Age Celtic sun god, Lud of the Silver Hand in Irish mythology. So as you say... That stone has morphed and transitioned in what it meant through 4,000 years, perhaps more, just as you say. So perhaps the megalithic stone fans that started out as monuments depicting lineages morphed and evolved within 60 years of having been built back there in 3000 BC. Well, I think the, it's true that whatever is in the landscape is viewed differently through time. And I have a Though some people dislike Heidi because of his politics, let me just say that in the year perhaps he is Merle Ponty and others as well. But in that phenomenological set, there's this concept that when you have something there that you've built or someone else has built, that then changes your belief system and it affects your belief and you create a new one. Yeah. And whatever you are always interacting with and creating new ideas as you encounter these monuments. And, and that kind of thing happens. But when, when you're talking about the building of uh, the fans, there's nothing to say they weren't built at the time with more than one connecting belief or concept. And it's the same with that um, viewing point of Orkney. Now, people recognise places as being important visually and they go, wow, from here, I can see this and that. This is really, oh, that's very significant. And they probably have stories about that for generations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then, then they decide, well, let's uh, mark that out. Sometimes in the middle of podcasts, Gail, I like to say things to make me sound smart. <laughs> so far you're doing really well because I'm thinking, mm. <laughs> But you're just inspiring so many things from years ago. I want to illustrate what you've just said with this observation which I've never read written. Returning to Brodgar in Orkney. Oh, I've actually written something about that in the paper and I haven't yet published it and I've been sitting on it for years and I've got to get it out there. It's amazing, yeah. So as you know from the 60s work of Alexander Tom, a lot of work has been done on the astronomical conditions involving the surrounding mounds on the um, peninsula there. Yes. But what I've not read written is exactly what you just said about its positioning within the greater landscape. The question is, why was it built on an eastward sloping part of that peninsula and not on the flat bit 100 metres further north? I think the reason is because see in that flat bit, Gail, the eastern stones create portals into Lake Hari, framing water. Mm. Because it's tilting to the west upwards, the western stones create portals framing sky. Mm. And I think that's why it was located on that tilt. What do you think? I really like that idea. Mm. Um, the other thing that I don't know is that actually they've recently done a massive geophysics job in Orkney. Yeah. Um, and what I want to know is what is on that flat bit next to it because was there something also already there? Uh -huh. And I think that's something that we have to ask ourselves. But I still actually very much like your interpretation of the importance of water and sky and landscape. Mm. Because it's a 60 stone circle, those gaps represent six degrees of space each. So to the west, six degrees of space is framed. It could be quite useful if you're monitoring passing stars, planets. But then look at it symbolically to have the, the, the lake, the provider of all sustenance, right there. Huh. Oh, that's a very nice concept. Um, I just, before I forget, I, the thing is, how does it change its relationship with the Ness of Brodgo with where it is now? 
compared to the flat area. And I'd need to study a map to answer that because I think that's really significant. The Nessa Brodga is just that site. Ah, oh, incredible. Do you follow the suggestions of Professor Tom and more recently Ewan McKay in Glasgow that there was a, here we go, a Neolithic astronomer priesthood versed in the skills of magic, geometry and astronomy? Or do you think otherwise? Because that's a big claim, Gail, and you're talking about the Nessa Brodgar. That would represent the living abode of such a priesthood. What do you think? Uh, I wanted to go back and answer the other question about that. Do it. I, I will answer that, but I just wanted to go back to that circle and the six and the six degree thing. Well, absolutely, it's, at least it's part of the concept of the three hundred and sixty degrees. You know, obviously, everything's not you know exact, but it's pretty close. And I and I think that is just linked to it, to the concept of circles and the way planets and things move and other things move. And I think. Uh, I just wanted to say I think that is significant, but I haven't done enough on that yet to really research it. But to go back to your question, mm -hmm. in Europe, on the continent, people are quite, and I'm talking about archaeologists, not archaeoastronomers, feel quite strongly that there might have been significant individuals in a society that had, uh, say, more knowledge about certain things than other people in their group. And they may well have been a priest of some kind that did the rituals, for example, or they may have been a small enclave. It depended on how big the group was. Uh -huh. Like, who's in, uh, is there someone that's in charge of these things? But I think the Nest of Brodga, there must have been a group of people that had more knowledge than others and may well have been um, seen as relevant and important and connected to those things. Uh, I just, the other thing though that we, that I can't remember, if, that I have to look up, I'm sorry, I have forgotten, is exactly when the different settlements existed in relation to the Ness of Brodgar. Because I think that's really, really important, Colin Richards would have brought that. Ness of Brodgar is 3,200 and Brodgar is 2,800, so there was a tradition there for 400 years before the building of the monuments, if I'm correct. Ness of Brodgar, yes, you're right about, roughly about the Ness of Brodgar, but the circle of Brodgar was, is, uh, thought to be uh, built around 2,500. Oh, really? It's the last large monument to be built in Scotland, as I understand it. I'm talking about large now, not there are plenty of others that get built later, obviously. And um, it's also the stones themselves are not very deep. Mm hmm so people, uh, people theorise, well, maybe it wasn't meant to stand for very long, but you know, here it is. <laughs> but uh, they were, But I've got an idea about about that, about its uh, mm, the speed with which it it's significant had to be. You know, we, here we are on the cusp of a massive change. How do we face that change that's coming coming at us from overseas <laughs> and bringing, you know, the the Catholic Bronze Age, not that they called it that. Here comes the Bronze Age, look out, everybody. <laughs> but here is a statement of their belief systems mm -hmm. being erected, perhaps quickly, close to also the time that the Ness of Brodga comes down. What do you mean by coming down? They're not falling down, but the fact that they then had this massive uh, ceremony where they slaughtered hundreds and hundreds of cattle in front of. I think it's structure 12. Yeah. At the Ness of Brodga, they dug this massive hole and they put them all of the sacrificed animals in there at this closing time. It all folds in. A bit sad, really. It is. I see a pattern within the structures there, um, and it's this. Stennis was built first, and there's 12 stones. Brodgar was a progression. There are 60 stones. Well, I don't think it's a coincidence that both 12 and 60 are central units in a sexagismal counting system, basically a, se a base 60 number system. And what that means is mm -hmm. perhaps this misinterpreted priesthood were people with above average IQ that were masters with measuring with ropes. They knew how to pull 30, 60 and 90 degree angles, the three easiest angles to pull with rope and posts. And that would lead you to building 12 stones 
but five of those 12 stones is Brodgar, 60. So I think they perhaps belong to a sexagismal number system. And that's why we see adherence to a base 60 in most of the monuments, and Buchan fits into that as well. Do you think they were more angularly aware rather than we are measurement aware? Mm. Mm. 60 being a base for all. It's tricky because I have never actually calculated the number of stone circles that have these numbers of stones versus angles and so on point. But I will say that sometimes these things cluster together. Maybe that group of people at that time operated that way. You can definitely uh, you know, measure things, draw out a circle and do all kinds of things with these tools. It is definitely possible. And people in the uh, archaeologists in the past have shown that when they've actually tried to uh, work out how to do an elliptical circle versus um, circle, circle, and how you can calculate that. There's a paper on Temple Wood, Phil Martin, and they had people coming in and looking at the geometry in detail. There's a very nice section in that paper on that about the importance of geometry. Aha. Uh -huh. But geometry is, in a sense, linked uh, in some ways. You need to understand angles to some degree, of course, for doing. The, uh, we do have some perfect circles yeah. for doing things like that. So certainly people had some knowledge, but to what degree and who had it? And I wouldn't say necessarily that someone had necessarily a high IQ or not because it's. I think it's about where you get uh, your training, who trains you, and what is your family status or your when were you born. Maybe that counts. Yeah. Literally under what star were you born or what planet or were you born when the fish was born? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you might have you might be trained in the knowledge of the fish. Absolutely. We don't know. We don't know that. Eight years ago, I wrote and published a book called A Twist in Time. And in that book, I reinterpreted all of the ceremonial artefacts recovered from Scar Bray and found that a great majority of them can be also be used for building and calibrating measuring ropes. Because, Gail... So if you're standing in the clear field site at Brodgar, the diameter is 54 metres. If you have a rope that, that measures 54 metres that you stake in the centre and then work around the outside, it will swell and shrink more than three or five degrees on any given morning or afternoon. <laughs> Every rope puller pulls stronger or weaker than the next. So Exactly, yes. Yeah. Broadgar is to within one degree. Mm -hmm. What that means is that what they must have done is bisected stones around a circumference, defining a centre, not pinning in the centre and measuring out. You just, ropes can't do it that accurate. To gain within one degree of accuracy, you're bisecting six degree angles on a wedge of wood or whatever else you might use. And I think that's real interesting because what it suggests is rather than our focus on centrality, defining space, defining the temple, defining the sacred site was perhaps more of a focus than what was actually at the centre. Yeah. I asked you two questions about Kenny, so let me give you his take on it. Regarding the latitude from, you know, Caithness over to Kalanish, the fans of Caithness to Kalanish, he thought that it was most probably observed by the builders of those stones absolutely no evidence that there was a connection between the two cultures, although there may have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But interestingly, regarding when I questioned him on the idea of a, an astronomer priesthood, a department of megalithic measurements, if you like, Kenny contests it and says it was much more human. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, indeed, there was people that were pulling geometric rope systems and they were they knew how to measure and how to build but it wasn't maybe as formalized as a priesthood that was being served on by yes, a populace yes. i don't think that there was necessarily a uh the priesthood was served by the populace at all yeah but i do feel that um that doesn't mean that there weren't some people who are more specialist than others and that they trained their the youngsters as they you know in similar things um so yes i don't think it was a, a setup like you know they got to sit there and no la di da around i wish it was gail because i'll share this with you and before you tell us what you found there i have oh, yeah. 
a confession and it's when I was 27, I tried to read a book and it was so beyond me that I had to put it down. But then when I got to 38, I read it again and <laughs> it describes for me the Professor Tom description of a priesthood and it's the glass bead game by Herman Hesse. Ah, okay. Won the Nobel Book Prize in 1942 and it was based in a future society, but it was about a remote priesthood of astronomers, geometers and magicians who entertained this game, a central community game. It illustrates what Tom was trying to suggest existed, which would be a college of proto-scientists who had mastered the megalithic yard, as Tom called it, absolute fluff gale. <laughs> Professor Tom measured 600 megalithic sites and he noticed measurement differences. Then what he did was he derived a, an average. Imagine taking an average from all the measurements and then going, here is the formal megalithic yard. Mm. So what I believe is the differences in the megalithic sites, while they're all quite close to this measuring unit, I think it's the differences in a ruler's forearm or the length of their feet. We certainly know historically, at least, and, and in ancient times, people did use big, literal measurements through, uh, use their body for measurements. And that's, of course, where we got a lot of our, excuse me, measurements uh, from, basically. I think the idea of an astronomer priesthood, which is, it's been talked about for, since the 60s, I think that creates a really dangerous veil because it stops people going, well, look, if they didn't exist, what did the people know? And it serves as a block to rope crafts, measuring skills, mm -hmm. community astronomy, all that's lost. Yeah. If they don't exist, what did the people actually know? Well, I think that people knew a lot mm -hmm. and because uh, you had to be multitasking, you had to know a lot of things, but that didn't mean that there weren't also people uh, some people that were better than others and for example we know that I'm not talking in prehistory now now I'm talking historical in later historical times like ancient Greece we do know that particular people were uh, you know are trained up but at what point did specialism begin we don't know we don't know when specialism really began exactly certainly in the bronze age there were people who were specialists so perhaps why not in the neolithic because perhaps there were, we do know that some potters were definitely better than others. You can find some things that, that is stunning. My God, who built that? <laughs> <laughs> so there are going to be some people who are better than others and they might then be the representative of their family group or their local group and they end up being, this is the potter family, literally, you know. Yes. So they may well be the ones who do most of the pots for everybody in the group as groups got larger. We don't really know how it worked, but we do know that in settlements there are areas where you did, you know, you've got your kilns over there, you've got uh, meat production over here, you've got flint napping over there, um, or in a few places, but all, mostly in those places and not in other places. Houses are divided. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, even individual houses are divided as well as settlements. So there must have been some kind of specialisation going on. And I think that's what people generally believe anyway. That's what so I think, and I think most archaeologists mm. do. You remind me of a beautiful situation. I was 24 field walking in Caithness with George and Nan Bethune from the Dumbeath Heritage Trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we discovered a mound aside the Yarrow's archaeological landscape, and this mound hadn't been logged, ah. and we were all excited. So, so I was looking round the mound for flints, and Nan said to me, she goes, you're wasting your time. And I went, what do you mean? And she said, if this is a settlement area, would you dare chip flints where your bairns would cut their feet? You'd throw them, wouldn't you? And guess what? You'd know it's coming here. <laughs> 20 metres from it, we found all the flints. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For her, her to even think of that humanitarian aspect of the archaeology, I thought that was beautiful. That reminds me of Levi Strauss's results about how you find where people were, because they were sitting around fires and people were throwing their stuff back yes. away from the fireplace and it may end up in a circle because if people are sitting in a circle. So <laughs> looking for half and understanding people's behaviour, very interesting. I wrote an introduction to an article once and what I did was I thought, 
let's describe what was going on. And I remember opening with the, the baby's faces were flickering orange and their eyes were barely open with the smoke, but they were listening to the clinking and the clunking of the nappers, the shearing and the pulling of the fishnet remainders. There was almost this entire auditory heritage going on around them that with every clink was teaching them mm. the, the, the rhythms of napping. Yeah, yeah. I love that idea. Mm-hmm. And a lot of archaeologists would like that these days. You know, sorry, I interrupted you. Thank you Not at all. Yeah, I yeah. think you're right. One of the themes I've found in interviewing people like yourself, Gail, especially this year, is there's such a step back from a trying to ascertain precision. Dr. Robert Barrett from the University of Belfast recently mapped the 23 circular temples in Malta. Ah, uh, yes. Where archaeoastronomers have been arguing, going, they're perhaps malaligned to the winter solstice sunset. He showed that by measuring from the centres or the back walls, I believe, of the temples, that the door portals, when you looked out, they weren't about that one day, that they marked a period of time from the 1st of December to the 1st of February. And it was a much looser alignment. So what that means is the temples were all absolutely aligned to a period of time correctly, not mal-aligned to the winter solstice. That's very, very, very interesting because I do know, uh, I was just thinking of Tor, I've forgotten his last name, Lindstrom, T-O-R-E, that's his first name, and he just did a, finished his PhD on the temples of Malta. Do you think you'd be interested in doing an interview with me? Yes, yes, I'll give you his surname, I think it's Lindstrom, but I'll just have to check because I've I do have quite a poor memory for names, even when I've known someone for 15 years. I'm really hopeless with that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to push you on that. Yeah, I will. Don't worry. It'll be easy to send it to you later tonight. Great. And what was his thing? Well, he's doing archaeoastronomy and alignments of different parts of temples. Okay. Mm -mm. Uh, but he's been doing it for a very long time. He's from Scandinavia but lives in Malta now. Mm. I must ask him for sure because, in that, as I mentioned, Robert Barrett just, this is so nerdy, he's going to love me saying that. He took, <laughs> he took the books of astronomy, the classic books of astronomical formulas, and guess what he did? He coded them into an archaeoastronomy program that he's not published yet, but he told me how it's working and what it's allowing him to do is position. Let's say he, st so he studied the Woodhenges in Ireland. So instead of approaching a Woodhenge and going, to which variance of accuracy is this proposed winter solstice alignment? What you do is you plug in the geographic data about the building mm -hmm. and you tell the program to show me all lunar alignments within a six year period or a 200 year period. Oh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, so what you're doing is coming at it from a what could be the reason rather than was it this reason or not? And I think that's wonderful, Gail. That's very interesting. You should say that because you were talking about maybe discussing things further south now. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would love to just, to just pull the conversation onto the Costa de Morty. And the simplest question to get you right in at the deep end is to, to describe the landscape and tell me about the astronomical significance or indeed the cosmological significance because as you pointed out they can't be taken apart i'm going to be a pain and say look i want to answer your other questions first do do let me just note that so we come back to it i thought you wanted to go down there yeah i do go on but differently sorry come right back to before it and i'm just going to shut up and let you talk no 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 i definitely uh like, there are two things that you were talking about, but the second one, which is, mm -hmm. which is very important, and you were talking about uh, the probability of the occurrence of lunar alignment, right? Probability. So basically, Silva and Pimenta some time ago in 2012, but firstly Da Silva in 2004, uh, put together a program or wrote a program to try and work out the frequency of a certain lunar phases yeah. and occurrences that would occur through the year at particular latitudes. What is the likelihood of their appearance uh, from a particular latitude? Mm -hmm. I'm just looking through here. And so what, what they did was basically um, 
So basically the probability of the density of a particular, we call it a declination, which is a variable that you can measure uh, the position of a planetary body. But then they would also talk about the phases, mm. the most likely uh, likely time during the year you would see it and so forth. And the things they looked at were the spring and autumn full moons and the winter last crescent and the summer first crescent, for example, and risings and settings. And they did that uh, for particular uh, latitudes. And I we use that in our work in Costa de Morte, but I just wanted to flag that, that that kind of approach is very important and that these people... Uh, da Silva, firstly, mm -hmm. uh, looking at one particular pho phenomena, then Silva and Pimenta in 2012 mm -hmm. uh, for their research in Portugal. Fabulous. Thank you. So I just wanted to flag that because I thought that links to that person that you were talking about. But now please ask me your question again. I'm sorry. Yeah, I sure I will. But I'm going to have to edit out every time you say sorry because oh. that's what this is all about. I can add that to the show notes, those two links you've given me there with the Da Silva 2004 paper. Isn't archaeoastronomy, aren't we experiencing the birth of what is a new science? I think actually we're experiencing the development of it. I think its earliest days have been, and I think we're moving forward. So you think it's a teenager? <laughs> oh, yeah, probably. We're moving in, but we are, uh, I think we're a little bit beyond teenager because really archaeoastronomy was really big in the 18th century, Yeah. for example. So you've got your 18th century uh, fans who would go and visit these, you know, the, usually the very wealthy would roam around and visit these great sites and uh, sometimes as astronomers, sometimes as amateur astronomers, sometimes just as amateur archaeologists. Hmm. And they were very much looking at the alignments of monuments and, and so forth. So, you know, uh, it's been, it went away for a while and it came back and then it, then it exploded in the kind of 60s and 70s. Then it calmed down a bit. Then it kind of, and then it's been going, you know, like Clive Ruggles has been working, was working a long time in Scotland from the late 70s doing his PhD at that time. Mm. In Scotland, I mean, of course, he still continues, but in other places like Hawaii and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that we're beyond, it's beyond its birth, but it's like all disciplines forever developing ever flowering with something comes up oh wow we've got this beautiful bloom look at this approach that's amazing and then the flower will die and a new flower comes and we've got another approach but we still remember what was done before and the important thing though is that what people forget is that some people get so excited they throw the baby out with a bath water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you go, ah but this thing we can't do that we have to interpret everything and go you can't just interpret stuff. You have to know for sure, uh, sorry, to a certain degree about something before you can interpret it. Mm -hmm. You just have to pull everything, all your knowledge and all the angles, pull it together. What have you got? Headache. <laughs> <laughs> so you happy to, if we do some wrap-up questions on Scotland, Gail, would you prepare to come on and do another recording for season two about the Costa del de Morte in entirety? It would be a pleasure. I'd have a great time, I'm sure, because you're wonderful to chat with. Good on you. And the second time, it'll be even better because we know when, I'll know when to shut up. I've got a couple of questions more about Scotland, and I think it would just take us to a natural end in the next five, ten minutes. What do you think? I'm very happy with that. Great. Why, in the Neolithic time period, did Scotland become peppered? with monumental landscapes why not before what changed to inspire the conversion of an otherwise mundane landscape <clears throat> firstly i don't think they would have thought their landscape was mundane i said i said that because i knew you would react i thought i'll let it go <laughs> i know that was cheeky i can see your i can see your cheeky smile in there i edited it in my mind and thought no i'm gonna let that go <laughs> What do you believe cosmologically or practically happened or changed to inspire that rash of sights? Well, cosmologically, if we're talking about linking things with the sky, I think that belief uh, and knowledge was already there. Mm -hmm. It ha had to have been there for a long time. You can't just suddenly build a monument and face it to something unless you already have had that knowledge around for a long time, particularly the lunar information. It would have to have been there before. 
solar is not, you know, you only need a few years if you really want to bother watching the sun because the sun barely changes its rising and setting positions for 2,000 years, maybe more. <clears throat> the moon is very variable and you really need to observe it for some time, for any uh, rough accuracy even. Uh, however, I really, uh, I, the thinking, and I kind of support this, is I think there's going to be a lot more interaction with Europe as well and because their monuments or their standing stones are much earlier. Mm -hmm. Their tombs are not much, their very first tombs are earlier, but some of them not much if you count some of the Scottish tombs and the Welsh and the mm. uh, er earliest Welsh tombs. They are earlier though. But when it comes to standing stones, standing stones are actually the, probably the first monuments in Western Europe and they come at least on mass shall we say, at least on mass, later in the British Isles. And I think that is probably partially to do with their connections with Western Europe along the Atlantic facade. I think it's to do with their relationships and connections there. Trade connections. I think that um, clearly they would have already had them, but I, I think there's a lot more connection like, um, you know, Neolithic sailing or, or, or rowing. Sailing, a lot of people say there's no sailing even in the Bronze Age, but we're already already coming down to that. Of course, they were sailing in the Bronze Age. <laughs> Another point. <laughs> I think when you say sailing, there, uh, not being in any ways rude, but do you think perhaps a better word choice would be seasonal fishing parties following shoals around the coast and to the islands? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, no, no, I think people were really travelling between the continent and the British Isles, and I'm not the only one to think that. But perhaps not sailing. Let's just go with rowing. <laughs> so, do you mean before Dogger Bank was flooded? Uh, Five thousand four hundred BC shelf collapsed in Norway. Yeah, I'm sure people were communicating before and after. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and by boat and otherwise. But when it comes to sailing, let me just add that point that I still think there would have been sailing in the Bronze Age, so people are still discussing that, but not necessarily in the Olympic. Mm. I think that's because they met the people who were doing it. <laughs> but have, surely there's evidence in the material artefacts if there was long-distance trading. I do believe there was axe heads from Ireland found in Orkney, but <laughs> surely there would be a lot more mixing in the cultural artefacts if there was long-distance trading, no? Well, I think well, it's not about trading necessarily because I'm sure Alison Sheridan's already pointed out that uh, there... Um, I guess it's like cultural trading and that's what I think Alison Sheridan believes that oh look we've seen New Grange let's build something like that and I'm not necessarily saying that's true or not true yeah and I, I love most of what Alison has to say actually but I'm just saying that uh, for example there's also trading even in Indigenous uh, Australian groups that that border each other they share rituals it's a special thing that you do where you trade a ritual, it's very important, or you give something, and the people actually in the other language group train their, for example, young men in a particular ritual. I'm just talking broadly. Uh, so maybe things like people may have been doing things like that, for for instance. Certainly, you know, Br British Isles, they would have been easily crossing over from Ireland to Britain regularly. I was foolish the way I proposed that. I, I, I don't know. No, it's a good question because some people might think No, it's think not. That. But here's why it's not a good question because I did this four episodes ago with Dr. Stephen Lexon in the Chaco Canyon and I said the same thing. I, I called it trade routes and he said this. He goes, Ashley, perhaps they're trade routes, but he goes, something that goes along with trade routes is the passing of ideas. And that's what you've just said. I should have said the trading of cultural artifacts and ideas because you're right. If I had been to Avebury, it's going to take me three months to get there from Orkney. If I see something impressive, I don't need to do much more than go home to Orkney and find a clear bit of sand on the beach and put sticks in the ground and go, I saw that, let's do it. Everyone's doing it down there. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> Every because they were. <laughs> It seemed to be monumentality, showing that you had mo a control of cardinality <laughs> and the monument was a really big distinguishing factor in one's perhaps power over a landscape and a people of... Do you think the birth of monumentality was the birth of 
social hierarchies, perhaps. Uh, some people, I think, do agree with that. They do mm -hmm. think it has uh, not necessarily large hierarchies because the Neolithic was still initially thought of as once upon a time and quite recently thought of being as a more equitable kind of society. Com but I would say perhaps it was compared to the Bronze Age. Yeah. It's just a comparative thing. There's always someone in charge. They can't help themselves. The hum humans can't help themselves. I think that someone's always going to be in charge. But how much there was a hierarchy is still discussed, I think, and argued about between archaeologists. And it might depend on which group you're researching. Because if you just have only a few tombs and uh, lots of related people are buried there, then you go, well, it's, that family must be possibly have some kind of either social status and or power. Mm -hmm. But there are other places where you get hundreds of tombs, like, you know, Galicia has potentially up to 9,000 megaliths as a really small area. So quite a lot of, and most of those are group, uh, oh, sorry, group burials, likely, compared to the rest of Iberia, if we compare it with the rest of Iberia. So with different dynamics are going on there. But now with genetics, we don't have bones in Galicia, so we're, we, we have no luck with that. But like in Ireland and, uh, and other places, they're doing genetics. On, are they related? Are these people related in tombs? And most often, so far, they seem to be. So really, I, I don't know what the level of hierarchy is, and I think in some places it's going to be quite strong, in others it's going to be looser. Yes. But there's always going to be someone in charge, just because of humanity. <laughs> Two years ago, a paper was published and they were studying models of the waves of migration out of Africa between 60 and 80,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And create the model they created showed random dots and dots represented people. And there was groups between 20 and 80. And they, they gave the geodetic and the topographic data and told the groups to come together, move north. And every time they ran the model, they got to this lake in North ah. Africa that the boats couldn't cross. They, what they did was they programmed one cell, one pixel, one unit yeah. to be a strong leader prepared to die to move north. And when they put that element in the model, it crossed the lake and moved into Europe. Yeah, yeah. I could, yes, yes. There's always an adventurer, right, Ashley? <laughs> You've got it. <laughs> Gail, I'm going to bring it to the last question, which I ask all Scottish archaeologists, and it's this. <laughs> what do you believe, in your own opinion, the primary function of the enigmatic stone balls recovered from settlements and rivers of Scotland ah. worked as? What do you think they were used as? You know, they are enigmatic. But let me tell you about Tess. Is it Tess Mackling? I saw her on Facebook. and. Uh, she may have got this idea from somewhere else, but she she got the stone balls and rolled them in sand. Mm. And they made this amazing, beautiful sand pattern. Mm. And I just thought, oh, that reminds me of the fact that many Indigenous cultures actually do the uh, equivalent of art in sand. Yes, indeed. And then rub out and start again. And they were amazing. And you could do spirals by rolling different kinds of spirals by rolling stones around. And I thought... That's wonderful. Yeah, I thought that was amazing. That was clearly not my idea, as I've just told you who mm. I got that from. Uh, it was really, really striking. Um, but in general, I just... they are. Why could they not be beautiful objects? That's what Kenny said. He said they're such beautiful objects, they're sacred items. So I'll tell you what I think they are, and then you can tell me if you think it's rubbish or not. <laughs> because half of them were found in rivers between Aberdeen and Orkney, and because they're all very, very smooth, I think they were maybe used by fishermen to wrap new leader twines around so that when they were out in a boat, they had a bag full of six balls with new leaders. So when they snapped a line, they could easily attach a new one without getting in a tangle or in a bird's nest in their bag. And I think they're fishing reels. Hmm. Well, that's a nice idea. But would you go to so much trouble to... Well, maybe you would, because why wouldn't you have a, an object that's beautiful and practical? And maybe one that my grandfather used. 
the answer to your rebuttal there is this, is I am a fisherman and when I go out fishing, yes. the number one problem you've got is if you pull a line out of a bag and it spins off the reel and goes into a big mess in your bag. Now, I can't believe I'm taking these such sacred devices and pulling them into the world of fishing reels, but I, it accounts for them being found in rivers because I asked Kenny, why would such a sacred object or 60% of them be found discarded in rivers? And he said... Why would they be discarded in rivers? What if they were placed in rivers? Yeah, because I, I was just, I was actually going to say that because, you know, why would you find so many Bronze Age swords in rivers? There you go. <laughs> Gail, thank you for being clear and succinct. It's going to make for such enjoyable listening. Oh, it's been a pleasure to speak with you. I've had such a good time. I'm sure it would be fun to do it again sometime. My next interview is with another colleague of yours tomorrow on Thursday, uh, Professor Philip Toner. Oh, yes, indeed, Philip. He is so knowledgeable about philosophy. Oh, my goodness. I'm crapping it a bit. I'm a bit nervous. Don't worry. Uh, if you need any background help, we can have a conversation before we speak to Philip. <laughs> <laughs> Let me fumble my way through that one. And then when it's out, we can do a review, the two of us, <laughs> and we can go, right, so on a degree from zero to ten, ten being you did great, Ash, and zero was you were a flump. <laughs> I enjoy, uh, I, I look forward to enjoying that conversation. Perhaps we'll do yeah. a cocktail to get through it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, indeed. But no, our next recording will be about the cost of Demorty and the astronomical conditions and the topography and the culture and cosmology down there. But Gail, could you tell the listeners where they can follow you, they can read you maybe some of your past papers, where can they follow yourself online? <laughs> yes, certainly. Uh, most of my, well, actually all of my work uh, is on uh, a site called academia.edu and you just type in www.academia.edu and then it has a search button and you can just type Gail Higginbottom. But I also have a Wix site also under my name. So that's a, that has uh, my project work from Casa de Morte only. I haven't done much on Twitter and um, that needs to be rectified. <laughs> but academia.edu, you can definitely find all kinds of things there, conferences, links to papers, nice pictures in the papers, and so forth. So uh, have fun reading through those, everybody. <laughs> Gail, thanks again for joining me on the History Fuzz podcast. That was great fun. It was indeed. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ash. If you enjoyed this episode, hit subscribe, drop a five-star review, or share it with a friend. And you can get in touch with me through HistoryFuzz.com.